We know the government doesn't need money to spend, so why does it tax? Governments exist to provide public services like the military, healthcare, and transportation networks. And this means the government has to provision itself by transferring goods and services from private to public domain. Today, this is done with a monetary system. It works like this. It begins with a tax levied by the government, payable only in its own currency, such as the dollar. Think of a property tax, for example, where everyone with a house has to pay a tax or lose their property. This creates sellers of goods and services seeking dollars in exchange. Now the people, who the tax caused to be unemployed, can be hired by the government and paid with as otherwise worthless dollars. For a historical example, let's look at what happened in the 1800s during Britain's colonization of Africa. In Ghana, Britain wanted to grow coffee. However, the local population had no desire to work for the British government. So the British imposed the hut tax, a tax on everyone's house, payable only with British script, and if the tax wasn't paid, the British burned their houses down. The tax immediately caused what we call unemployment, people looking for paid work, and the British then hired them to work in the coffee fields. Since the British desired only a portion of the village to be working on a coffee plantation, the wage that the British paid was more than enough to pay the tax. First, the British would pay the wage. Then, the people would pay some of it back in taxes and the rest they had was savings that could be used to buy things from other people. Lessons from Ghana Lesson 1. The British had to spend their script before collecting taxes. Where else could it come from? It was obvious to all that the British paid their workers first and then collected taxes. The same is true in the US today. All the dollars that can be used to pay federal taxes come from lending and spending from the federal government and its agents. And close examination of government accounts, in fact, confirms the US government spends first and then is paid taxes or borrows the dollars it already spent. Lesson 2. The British always spent more script than they collected in taxes. In other words, they were always operating with a deficit. This meant that people were looking for more script than they needed to simply pay the tax, which created a supply of script held by the public that hadn't yet been used to pay taxes. And the extra script that the British spent added to the money supply and savings of the economy. We can see the same thing happening in the U.S. today. Let's assume that the government pays you $4,000. Tax dollars are subtracted out of your account, leaving you with $3,000. Those after-tax dollars that remain in people's accounts are collectively known as the public debt, or the net savings in the economy. Lesson 3. The value of the script was determined by the amount of work the British required to earn it. For example, if the British gave workers one coin for one day of work, the coin would be worth one day of work. So what does that mean? Assuming the only way to get script from the British is to grow coffee, some people would have to get script through other means. For example, if a chef wanted to get script, he'd have to get script from someone else who would be willing to work for the British growing coffee by selling him food in exchange for the extra money that the person earned for growing coffee. So how did these two people determine a price? They come to a mutual agreement about the price, which today we call market forces. Prices where buyers and sellers come together. In this case, the price would be based on how hard one has to work to get the script from the British. However, if the British started paying two coins for each day of work, the coin would then be worth half as much. If you recall, the food that the chef was exchanging was originally worth a day's work. Since you can now earn two coins for a day's work, the price of the same amount of food would go up to two coins. The same is true in the US today. Whether the government knows it or not, the value of the dollar is based on the prices the government pays when it spends. Lesson 4. Unemployment. Under the British, there was no unemployment in Ghana. 
The British imposed a tax that created unemployment, but then it hired those people to work in the coffee fields. What if the tax caused more people wanting to work than the British wanted to hire? No problem. The British could either hire them or reduce the hut tax, which reduced the amount of time that people needed to work for the British. And the same is true today. U.S. tax liabilities create unemployment, which allows the government to hire the people it needs in exchange for the U.S. dollar. Therefore, today's unemployment is the evidence that the government's tax liabilities created more unemployed than the government has hired. The resolution is obvious. The government can either hire the people that it made unemployed, or they can lower the tax. So these people can go back to the private sector where they came from. However, there's one additional consideration. Private sector businesses don't like to hire people who are unemployed. They prefer to hire people already working. To promote the transition from unemployment to private sector employment, the government can offer a transition job to anybody willing and able to work. This has become popularized as the job guarantee.